So thank you, Robin, for the introduction. Um, so welcome everybody um, to this um, webinar dedicated to the NERD vocabulary server. Um, the vocabulary server can be accessed uses, using this, uh, this link. Our webinar will be in two parts. Uh, the first part will be done by myself uh, and um, it will be an overview of, of what the NVS is and why vocabularies are important. And then the second part, Alexandra will take over for a technical walkthrough um, some of the base, technical basis of the NVS. So what is the NVS? Uh, it is a semantic repository for standardized terminologies that are used for the management of data in the marine and related domains. Uh, it stores and serves terms and their relationships and relationships between terms in a human and machine readable format. And here's a screenshot of some of the, of one of the page of our uh, lookup server. So standardized terminologies are knowledge organization systems, um, also known as COS. They range from simple list of terms uh, to full ontologies. So a simple list of terms could be things like uh, groceries, dictionaries, um, and they are used to organize information and to provide uh, terminologies to catalog and retrieve information by human and machines. As this diagram on the right uh, from Veng uh, shows, um, knowledge organization system, the entities can be aligned along a gradient of increasing structural complexity and a uh, range of functionalities. The main functionalities we are trying to address are eliminating ambiguity in language, managing synonyms, uh, establishing hierarchical relationships uh, like term A is broader than or narrower than, than term B, or associative relationships like term A is related to term B. And at the most complex level, attributing properties to objects. And this is what ontologies do. Like, uh, term A as name, term B. So the NVS provides access to lists of control vocabularies and thesauri and publishes them using standards and ontologies, including RDF and SCOS. I won't go into the detail of RDF and SCOS because this will be covered by Alexandra later. So the NVS in operation, how does it look like? It's uh, a few background information. It was um, launched in 2005 as part of the NERD Data Grid project, which was, um, which was a first attempt to improve data discovery and access across distributed data sources, for mainly for oceanographic and atmospheric data. Then the NVS was further developed thanks to European funding, uh, through the uh, Open Service Network for Marine Environmental Data, also known as NETMAR, as well as CDATANET and CDATA Cloud projects. So it is used globally, as you can see on the map on the right hand side, there are geographic distribution by monthly number of sessions uh, over the last 12 months until uh, October 2021. Um, with the uh, largest uh, usage being the US, in the US, in Australia, and uh, in Europe. So the NVS underpins elements of large international observing data networks, including, of course, CDATANET and EMODNET data infrastructure in Europe. Um, this infrastructure is a distributed uh, marine data infrastructure for the management of data derived from in-situ measurements in seas and oceans by a pan-European network of marine data centers. Recently, the Argo Float Program adopted the NVS to host its collections uh, of control vocabularies. Argo is an important international program that has deployed some 4,000 robotic uh, floats over the last two decades in order to measure water properties across the world ocean. Then the Ocean Biodiversity Information System, uh, which is an infrastructure for marine biodiversity data, which is now managed under the auspices of the IOC, also uses some of the control vocabularies uh, developed by CDATANET 
um, or as part of CDataNet uh, to underpin its management of environmental data and as a consequence has adopted uh, MVS as well. And then another example, which is outside of, uh, of the completely marine domain, if you want, is a move bank, uh, which is a database for animal tracking data and which has selected the MVS as well to host and manage its own vocabulary collections, supporting its uh, uh, data transfer system. So uh, what is the MVS useful? Uh, well, it is used for two main purposes. One is semantic annotation and the, the other one is semantic alignment and mapping. So for the semantic annotation of data sets with machine accessible terms, that either those, because those terms uh, comply with uh, the, the user's chosen metadata standards or simply to harmonize information by introducing consistency in the terms used uh, for given concepts. This helps with the cataloging of the information and also with the creation of uh, reproducible validation workflows, for example. It also improves the accuracy and the selectivity of search tools and the efficiency of automated and semi-automated processing routines. Then the semantic alignment and mapping is used for improving interoperability and data integration uh, within domain and across domain. So here on the right is an example of, uh, it's a screenshot of the CDATANET search interface, which enables users to search data based on a wide range of criteria, thanks to standardized vocabularies uh, used to annotate, annotate the files. So who uses the NDS? Um, it is used by people who create and curate data, uh, database managers, data workflow engineers in the marine and related scientific field. A large proportion of current uh, users are actually scientists, data managers, and engineers involved in sensor-based observing networks uh, because of the growth in autonomous and semi-autonomous observations of the environment and the increasing demand of control vocabularies uh, that uh, is associated with that. And more and more, the NVS is also accessed by tools uh, developed by API and web, users de web user developers as well. So the graph uh, at the bottom of the slide shows monthly number of users from October 2020 to 2021. And you can see that uh, for the second part of that year, uh, we had steady values between five and 8,000 users per month. So why is a dedicated vocab service so important? Well, it enables us to have a central repository of uh, shared vocabularies, shared, shared terminologies. Um, the content governance uh, associated with it and the gatekeeping ensures harmonious growth based on consistency in decision and adherence to vocabulary management best practices. Um, also the human gatekeeping element helps improve content quality by ensuring that uh, no obvious errors are introduced and responding also enabling a quick response to users' feedback. Uh, the technical governance ensures rigorous version tracking reliability of services and up-to-date technology. Finally, having uh, such a dedicated service nurtures uh, human expertise, in-house human expertise and skills. Um, and finally, it also, um, it also ensures a long-term continuity uh, uh, that uh, or stable, stable um, uh, stabilities that uh, uh, foster international and cross-domain collaborations. So what are the challenges? <clears throat> well, you could have, uh, the first challenges are related to language itself, of course. Um, here, uh, you can have similar items, similar objects with different words. Uh, of course, there's a well-known differences between the British and the American uh, English, um, but even in the scientific field, um, Conventions are many and adherence to a common language is difficult. So if you take this example on the right there from uh, KB, which is a well-known repository for information uh, related to chemical entities of biological interest, you can see that for a simple molecule, it lists 20 different synonyms. Uh, and for, for simple molecules that is commonly known as uh, ethanolamine. 
So it's, and it's um, many, many chemical substances, especially contaminants have a wide range of synonyms, which makes the um, transfer of information about those uh, chemicals very difficult. Then the same word can have different meanings. Um, and here, if you, there's an example of uh, the usage of pint in Australia. And depending where you are in Australia, you will have um, less beer for your money than, um, than in other states. Um, so this emphasizes a need for standards, of course. Uh, in this case, it would be the metric system, but also the need to, to have information uh, about the context around the term to avoid misunderstandings. So human brain is, is very good at understanding context implicitly, but machines will always need a context to be explicit. So in this example, um, for example, um, the, it, just writing temperature in the header of a column of a CSV file, for example, is not enough to make this data readily understandable by automated software. We need to capture both the term temperature and its context in machine readable format. And in this case is where, where the temperature was measured, uh, water, temperature of a water body measured by a, a sensor in the sea or different kind of um, uh, contextual information. But standardization is hard um, and this is a massive challenge. Um, but that can be helped by uh, using uh, semantic uh, resources. And this is be partly because it costs effort to change our ways. Um, however, the consequences are sometimes very costly. And if we take this famous example of the Mars Climate Orbiter, which crashed uh, to pieces in 1999 due to somebody in the processing chain assuming uh, that the data they received had already been converted to metrics, while in fact they were still in English and in, or Imperial units. So this costly disaster might have been avoided if control vocabularies and metadata standards had been used. Um, and by having a mandatory field, for example, for units in a machine and human readable format in the data being transferred to NASA, a program could have been written to validate the data. So another challenge is to keep pace with new terminologies. Um, as new methods are invented, new discoveries made, new concepts created. If we think about what we've all experienced uh, over the last couple of years with communication about COVID and its associated concepts, the apparition of new terms and the need for these to be defined and understood by a large number of people from disparate backgrounds is a good example. Quickly, we realized that in order to make sense of what was happening around us, we needed to agree on, on a common language. Hence, appeared specialized glossaries uh, dedicated to COVID uh, and created to support communication. So it's not only just about keeping pace with uh, concepts and terms, but also keeping pace with new connections. Um, the, um, in the background of, of the COVID um, pandemic, a whole range of activities also started establishing new connections to enable the fast processing of complex information in the form of ontologies and mapping between data so resources to bridge across disciplines. Because as we know, COVID didn't just have an impact on, on human health, it had also an impact on the environment and on the people's lives and livelihoods. And it was important to actually be able to process its information very quickly. And this has been reflected and supported by the rapid development uh, uh, or extension um, to existing semantic resources and also the creation of new ones. So another challenge is the proliferation of terminologies. And this is often driven by disconnection of activities, regional variations, pressure to deliver. And here on the right hand side, there is an example of uh, pitch litter guidelines for, uh, where there are many guidelines um, according to different regions and they don't fully overlap, they don't fully uh, align. And it is, um, 
it is important. So, so the object monitored are not the same everywhere in the world. So it's very difficult to have a global assessment of the impact of uh, beach litter. Um, so this is resolved by, the, uh, by setting up a, uh, the establishment of a global partnership that can help align existing content and ensure the that future growth remains aligned so that global impact can be assessed. So semantic artifacts uh, are often referred, oops, sorry. Um, so the, um, another aspect is the, um, the importance of data quality. Um, the um, data notation is a facilitator in the journey of building reliable uh, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning. However, the output is always only as good as the input. And there's always um, data outputs sometimes suffer from the JIGO garbage in, garbage out principle. So, and it was illustrated recently by the publication of uh, this study by MIT, uh, which discovered some uh, substantial errors in, in data sets uh, used for machine learning uh, benchmark, where images were mislabeled. And uh, so it's important to use trusted data sets that have been validated by humans in order to, um, in order to trust the, the output of uh, processing. So semantic artifacts are often referred to as a glue that brings uh, distributed information systems together and enables greater capacity for artificial intelligence and machine learning applications, um, including data discovery, analysis and integration tools, and building bridges across silos uh, of information. And as often with glue, uh, if you have done a good job, it should be invisible. So the complexity should be hidden from the user. However, without it, even the best designed tools and the best presented data will fail to deliver what we need in order to address the urgent environmental and societal challenges we are trying to address. So it is important to annotate data with standardized fair terminologies in order to improve findability facilitate interoperability and optimize reusability. And it is not sufficient to have open data, but link data in order to connect data sources and services in the digital world. In 2006, Tim Berners-Lee challenged us to envisage the World Wide Web as a semantic web, a web that is not just about putting data out there, but also about making links so that a person or machine can explore the web of data with linked data. Can explore the web of data with linked data. When you have some of it, you can find other related data. And now I will pass on to Alexandra for the technical part. Thanks, Ben. That was brilliant. So in this technical walkthrough, um, I will explain what are the building blocks of the technical infrastructure of NDS. So I will talk about RDF, SCOS, how NDS is aligned with RDF and SCOS, about Sparkle and how NDS is aligned with link data. Um, and at the end of this technical walkthrough, um, I would like you to be more acquainted with NVS technical infrastructure. And I would like you, I hope you will uh, feel that all these acronyms are not that hard to understand and use. So RDF stands for the resource description framework and is a language to describe resources. A resource is anything in this world, a book, a movie, a web page, or a term. And in RDF, this thing has to be identified by a universally unique identifier or a URI. What can you do with uh, um, this uh, URI? 
is that you can unambiguously describe a concept, a resource, or a thing. You can specify how your resources can be related with each other. And maybe you can do some basic inferencing. Uh, in RDF, everything is expressed as statements um, that are called triples, and they have a subject, a predicate, and an object. For example, you can make a statement that Bob knows Alice, where Bob is the subject, knows is the predicate, and Alice is the object. Your eyes can appear in all places of a triple. And they are important because they are global identifiers that enable other people to reuse them to identify the same thing. For example, this URI FOF nose is used by people in the semantic web to state an acquaintance a relationship between two people. FOF is a machine readable ontology that describes people, activities, and the relationships between them. Um, and nose is the property of this ontology that describes acquaintance. In the same way as FOF describes people in RDF, SCOS, which is the simple knowledge organization system, provides a standard way to represent knowledge organization systems in RDF. For SCOS, the scope of knowledge organization systems includes SRI, controlled vocabularies, taxonomies, classification schemes, and subject heading systems. When you, annotate, when you encode your COS with SCOS, you make your COS machine readable and interoperable. Some things that you can define in SCOS are concepts, collections, mappings, and the SORI. A concept is an idea, a notion, or a term, like sneezing or coughing. A collection is an ordered group of SCOS concepts. For example, the collection of symptoms can include concepts like sneezing and coughing. A mapping is a link between two SCOS concepts. For example, cough and respiratory disorders can be associated using a link or a property that is called narrower. And you can say that cough is narrower than respiratory disorders. And finally, a thesaurus is an aggregation of one or more SCOS concepts. But not only you can list things with scores, but we can actually add properties to describe them in more detail. Here, you can see a thing. And using the RDF type property, you can identify that this thing is a SCOS concept, that it has a preferred label that is CAF, and that is written in the English language. But you can also use another preferred label with a different language in French, and that is two in French. And then you can use several other properties to further define your um, thing. The things that we describe in NBS um, are SCOS concepts, like high volume air samplers, <laughs> CAA weather station, meters, moles per second, etc. These SCOS concepts are grouped into collections like the device catalog L22 or the units of measure P06 or the device categories L05. Currently, NVS counts 290 collections and over 325,000 concepts. 
this is an RDF, an RDF graph of how things in NVS look like. For example, if you wanted to read this RDF graph, you would see that this thing that is called L22 is a SCOS collection and it has a certain description, an alternative label, and it has two members, both of which are concepts and they have their own preferred labels. So up until now, we talked about things in SCOS. We talked about their properties in SCOS. Uh, SCOS can also allow, enable uh, the creation of semantic relations that can be either hierarchical or associative. For example, we can say that meteorological packages are broader than the CAE weather station. And here we establish a hierarchical relationship, but we can also say that CAE weather station is related to its manufacturer, which is CAE Italy, and that's an associative relationship. We can also establish external mappings, which means that we can associate NVS concepts, not only to concepts from NVS, but also to um, concepts of other vocabularies like uh, this concept, which is meters from our P06 vocabulary, which we have established that it is the same as the meter from DBpedia or the meter from QUDT. And this is a high level view of how one collection is related to several other collections inside NVS. You can create more of these diagrams and maps in that link on the top right. Uh, as we said, um, in NVS, we list collections and each one of them has a unique URI that follows a certain pattern. This is the pattern. And here we saw that our collections all have a three um, three character string. For example, this is the URL of L22 vocabulary. Concepts in NBS have a unique URI, and the pattern that they follow is that they have to belong into a certain um, collection, and then uh, they will follow with their own uh, unique uh, identifier. Uh, Concepts also have versions, so you can track how they've evolved through time. And the version is a number at the end of the uh, concepts URI. Oops. Um, okay. Um, and finally, oh. Okay. And finally, we have uh, unique URIs for mappings as well. And we identify our mappings, we divide our mappings in internal and external ones. And this is an example of a unique URI for a mapping. Um, now, we, we talked about the RDF, the SCOS, and the URIs. All of these can be stored in a triple store, which is a specialized graph database or a database where you store RDF triples. These triples can then be queried online using the Sparkle query language, which is the equivalent of the SQL language for relational databases. Several of our tools in NVS are based on our Sparkle endpoint. And since we talked about all these technologies, it's about time to show you how NVS is aligned with linked data. Uh, linked data is a set of principles on how to publish structured data on the web, coined by Tim Berners-Lee in the Design Issue Note Linked Data in 2006. 
So Tim Berners-Lee said, if you want to publish structured data on the web, you have to use URIs as name for things and use HTTP URIs so that people can look up those names. So of course we use unique URIs for each of the things that um, NVS is um, um, listing. And when you click in one of these URLs, you will get a user interface that will tell you more about what this URL is about. The next um, principle is that when somebody looks up a URI, provide useful information using the standards RDF and Sparkle. When you click this URL, you can um, get RDF. This is how RDF looks like. We use content negotiation to provide either um, the user interface in HTML or RDF. But you can also go to our Sparkle endpoint and use the standard of Sparkle to describe this particular URI. And the next principle is to include links to other URIs so that people can discover more things. So here is a link that takes you from this particular URI to a different URI that um, states equivalence and it will take you to the QUDT vocabulary. This is a diagram to show you how you can access NBS, either as human, as human or as a machine. So as a human, you can access uh, the NBS user interface. I think um, it didn't take me. Um, so you can access the NBS user interface or you can access the NBS search to search for terms, for collections, and for mappings. Or if you are an authorized vocabulary editor, you can use the NBS editor to create new terms and mappings. For machines, we provide three web services, a Sparkle endpoint where Sparkle queries can be expressed, a RESTful API published uh, publishing NBS as linked data and providing different serializations like RDF XML, JSONLD, Turtle, and many more. And finally, a SOAP web service. Um, in uh, in uh, the paper, temple, 10 simple rules for making a vocabulary fair that is shown up here. The governance of a terminology is highlighted as a very important requirement. All the background work to keep NVS alive and operational is performed by a team of experts, the vocabulary management group that performs different tasks that can be shown here. So when new requests are um, uh, received by the team, they have to perform the gatekeeping of these requests. They provide technical support to external users and groups. They provide advice and consultation. They perform research. They liaise and contribute to these groups, external groups. They create collections and concepts and mappings. They publish them. They update and maintain existing content and its metadata and they map and align concepts with internal and external concepts as well. And here is the procedure if you want to request new terms. So for, extern for, for end users that want to request new terms, there are three different ways to go. The first way is to visit our GitHub uh, um, account and um, go to the required vocabulary following this URL pattern. And when you are in this repository, you can create issues to create new terms or ask questions. 
um, users can also send emails to vocab.services at bodc.ac.uk. And if users are authorized um, vocabulary editors, they can directly use the vocab editor to create new terms and mappings. So that's the final slide. And um, here is the NVS uh, operational and having revealed some of its ingredients of successful operation alongside why it is important. We are ready to receive questions and we hope that you learned a little bit more about NVS. Thank you very much, Gwen and Alexandra. That was a really interesting and illuminating talk. Um, we, I'm sure we have lots of questions um, and we do have time to take some. So if people have any questions, please feel free to pose them in the chat or the, the Q&A section. Um, I did have some come in during the talk uh, that we can start with. So um, I'll start with this one. How easy would it be to extend the NVS to incorporate vocabulary terms, uh, vocabularies and terms from my project? There's two ways to answer that, isn't it? I mean, technically, it would be easy uh, in terms of human resource. It would be more difficult. Um, so it's it would need a, a source of funding. Uh, to um, to create the vocabulary and and uh, and populate it with um, the terminology that is submitted and I think I should add as well that we don't want to especially to 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 publish any kind of vocabularies in the NVS so it would have to go through a, through a, a, an evaluation process because we want to we want to maintain quality of the information um, that is served by the NDS. So in the past, we have been approached by people working for a project and saying, well, look, and that's what happened with MoveBind. I've got this terminology, you know, would you be able to serve it through the NDS? And basically what we did is just look at the terminology and it was, it was ticking all the boxes. So yes, in this case, absolutely no problem. We created a collection put the term there, and then the people in charge are now using the vocab editor to maintain, to maintain their, own, their own vocabulary resource. So we almost, once it's set up, we almost don't need to do much more except the, the basic gatekeeping to make sure that there's no, no big errors of editing errors in, um, in the uh, like structural errors in what is being submitted. But in terms of content, it's, fully the responsibility of the people uh, who are designated editors um, and representing the governance of that particular vocabulary. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question has come in. This is from Anne Gledson and uh, she's asking, does something like this exist for the health sector? Of course. Um, <clears throat> so there is the MESS, which is the medical subject headings. Uh, headings uh, that exists for the, the, the medical domain. It's the bio portal as well. That is a portal that brings together different ontologies and vocabularies. Uh, so I would suggest maybe the bio portal as a first entry point to uh, discover what is in there and then go deeper. Okay, thank you. So. Um, Another question is, how does the NVS align with similar international initiatives? Um, how are overlaps and differences handled um, between those initiatives and the NVS? In terms of vocabularies? In terms of content alignment. I mean, we are connected with uh, many groups around the world, so we, we work in, in strong collaboration with others. So uh, through the Research Data Alliance, we have a um, forum for data inter for um, semantic interoperability that enables us to, um, to find ways of actually aligning with others. Um, so 
I can, I can say about the Rosetta Stone project mm -hmm. that we, um, what we did in this project is that because US, Australia and Europe were using different vocabularies to say the same thing, um, we created a proof of concept <laughs> where we mapped platforms, sensors and parameters between Australia, Europe and, and, and US and um, we created translations and then uh, a software could go on top of this translation and discover data sets that uh, existed um, uh, for, for a certain um, um, keyword that existed in all of these different repositories uh, across the world. So it can work really well. And if you have annotated your data sets with a vocabulary, that's the most important thing because the next step is to create the mappings and create these translations. Okay, thank you. We've got another question here. This is from Rachel Heaven. Um, and she says, thanks Gwen and Alex, is your vocabulary editor tool something you've written yourself or is it an off the shelf slash open source tool? So the editor is, um, is an ad hoc tool. It was written in, in the ODC, I would say years ago. We've recently uh, revamped the tool. Uh, it's not very open to many users. So there are not many authorized users that we have allowed that to, to be used uh, for, but we intend to open it up uh, more so that people can actually uh, self-manage their vocabularies. Okay, thank you. Uh, I've got another question, uh, which is, we, we hear a lot about the FAIR data principles. Um, so what are the ways that approaches such as NVS can help the move towards um, being fair? Um, first of all, the I2. So from the FAIR principles, the I2 principle says that you have to annotate your data with vocabularies that are fair in order to achieve the interoperability. So, and that's why we said that it is important to uh, use vocabularies to make your data fair, but it's also important to use fair vocabularies to make your data fair. Um, it will, it is one of the requirements for fair for the fair uh, movement to annotate your data with vocabularies. Okay. Well, basically, uh, data can't be interoperable unless they are annotated with machine readable vocabularies. They just otherwise they don't they don't comply with that interoperability limit. Yeah, it's it's the building blocks. They still have comply with standards and all of that, but the, one of the building blocks is the, the and it is the I2 if, they, if somebody wants to look it up. Yeah, so this is a question I had. I mean, I, I've worked in the ODC for many years and our data managers take data in and we use uh, vocabularies from the NVS to mark up those data so that they can be interoperable and more easily reused. How do we get it so that the scientists or the data collectors are using these vocabs from the off rather than it being something that happens further down the chain? Yeah, that's a good question, Robin, and it's very important. And I, I think it's a priority for the near future is to actually make control vocabularies more, more less daunting for, for, for scientists who create the data. And this is something we really want to get involved in to work closely with scientists so that, so that we can use, because we should be able to use the NVS so that scientists can still use their own terminology or pet name for their variable, but it, providing they map those pet names to the standards that we've got in the NVS, then we can actually, without very much effort from their side, um, we can, those, when they create those files, they will be automatically linked to a, a standard uh, control vocabulary in the NVS. Um, and it's very important for us as well as a data center and as data managers, we would have a much more efficient workflows if we didn't have to retrospectively 
try to understand what the scientific variable is, what the methodology was, or what the instrument was, if all that came to us already uh, quality controlled and approved by the scientists who actually was involved in collecting the data, rather than doing that sometimes maybe three years after the data was collected. So it's, it's a really important um, priority, I think, for, for our, our area of activities. Yeah. It is, and, and I'm aware that um, some of the instrument manufacturers are now starting to come on board with controlled vocabulary. So if we can get them from the off, outputting the parameters already using the vocabularies, then we're off to a flying start, I think. Yeah, that would be, yeah, that would be brilliant. brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so I suppose another question is, what are the big challenges facing the NVS in the next three to five years, do you think? Well, I think the main one is sustainability of funding. Um, because there's a lot of work happening in the background that people don't always realize. And it's quite, it's quite cheap to create one term, but when you have to create like hundreds of terms per month, or, or it's, it just starts you know, taking time from core funding. So, so it's, um, or taking a resource from core activities. So it's, it's, it's trying to develop that funding model that enables us to be I mean, we are sustainable, but to be financially sustainable, um, and in terms of technical of challenges, technical challenges yeah. I would say that uh, being on the forefront and being able to um, align with what is happening in the world, we have our backups by being part of participating in European projects that uh, achieve this being in the forefront of the technology, but also being in this RDA groups is really important for us to, to get updated, but also um, have a platform for discussion for issues that come up uh, with the semantic web community. Okay. So another question is uh, that much of contemporary science is by nature interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary. Um, how can SCOS approaches be used for integrating ontological thinking across disciplines? For example, environmental science and social science or engineering. Um, so an example might be modeling the impact of the environment on the built infrastructure. How do you expand out to, to handle interdisciplinary contexts? Okay. Can I just start to differentiate between ontologies and vocabularies? Because they are different things. <coughs> Ontology can help you model the world and the vocabulary, you can consider it as a drop-down list in a user interface or a drop-down list inside an ontology. So there are slightly different and they have different purpose to fulfill. Uh, on the cross-discipline and interdisciplinary um, um, purpose, uh, I would let Gwen talk about iADAPT. Well, yeah, I, I suppose the, um, in, in order to create this interdisciplinarity, we need to work collaboratively with others, of course. And uh, as part of the Research Data Alliance, uh, I adopt working group, which uh, focused on how we label things we measure or, or predict. Or, uh, so the name we give to, to a, a variable. And we, for the last two years, we've been working on developing an uh, interoperability framework for agreeing on common elements that needs to go into the definition of those variable names or variable labels, because they are sometimes they are not just one name, one word, they are sometimes complex description of what is being measured. And in environmental science, very often it's very important to, to know precisely uh, what was measured. Um, there's a lot of, inform a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, properties or, 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 or observations are made by proxy as well. So it's very important to actually describe exactly one thing can be measured with different methods. So you need to be able to distinguish between those different methods. 
So, so we've for the last two years we've been working on that, and we have developed. We have uh, released our first uh, recommendation document, as well as uh, an ontology that enable cross-disciplinary mapping of uh, viable uh, vocabularies. But this is just one element of the whole uh, uh, data landscape, really. But that needs to happen at multiple level. Um, things like maybe instruments, it might be sensors, it might be easier because very often sensors, whether they are in the sea, it's a continuum, but it's, it's, it can be part of the same collection. So it's rare when you, you will have you know, overlaps or you need to have overlaps of terms for, for sensor models, for example. It's good to just have one sensor model registry and then everybody uses that. But for other terminology, it's good to actually have discipline specific uh, kind of vocabularies that then we just developed in concert, well, developed in uh, ensuring that what is common to those different vocabularies are actually aligned. What needs to be common is aligned, and then the rest can uh, specialize in the different, different fields. I will add here that apart from linked data across disciplines, we also need linked people, so we do need agreements inside the domain and in cross domains because the you definitely need to establish the language to understand what each domain tries to say, but also agree on how to say all these things. So apart from linked data, it's about linked people as well. And the agreement, it's really, really important. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think that's all we've got time for today. So I'd like to thank again our speakers, Gwen and Alexandra, for that great presentation and discussion.